Information is power. Tell the truth. Tell the truth. Information is power. Information is power. Tell the truth. Tell the truth. Information is power. This is Information Man of the Information Man Show. Let me just say to everybody out there, thank you for supporting the program. I will have live stream programs where I interview people, and I will be uploading pre-produced videos such as this, and I will be um, spending some other, some more time uploading material to this channel as well. I've been doing a lot of work on my second channel, the Information Man Speaks podcast. I would like a lot of you to go over there and subscribe to that channel, be a part of that channel and what I have going on over there uh, because I'll be doing some commentary that will be different than the commentary that I normally do on this channel. Some similar but some different, different style. What I want to do and what I'm about to say and about to display on this program today, this evening, this night, this morning, wherever you are in the world watching this video at this moment, this broadcast, is going to uh, make some people upset, some people uneasy, some people uncomfortable, and some people say, yeah, that's the truth, Info. You're putting out the truth because my channel was about truth. Yeah, the truth. And sometimes truth is going to make certain people uncomfortable in this world. It'll make certain groups uncomfortable. And the truth of the matter is, if it makes you feel uncomfortable, that's on you because this is history. This is the history of this country. This is the history and the reality. Now, before I get into this presentation, because this is about ancient Jamama, okay? The ancient mama on the pancake box. We all grew up as kids, seeing her go through different transformation. Now, the first picture that you saw on the screen in the opening of the program was her having the handkerchief on her head, okay? And then eventually they turned around and gave her a perm like this to try to modernize her up. Now, for many years, um, you know, there have been black people that have complained about this image because this image comes out of a long tradition of minstrel shows and caricatures de meant to demean the, the lightness in the character in the image of black people. When you look at the history of this uh, pancake mix, and there's a lot of um, different uh, folklore around this image. And I'm here to put an end to that. Now, there's there's probably a lot of different videos out there since they decided to rebrand and get rid of the image of her because of the everything that has taken place with George Floyd. You got Black Lives Matter. You got people out there protesting, what have you. And I think these companies are removing this image, not so much because they really give a damn about black people or what's happening. I think they're seeing something that's happening and they're saying we got to protect our our uh, economic interests. We need people to continue buying our products. So and I, and I think once again it shouldn't have took all of this that has happened transpired over the last few months for them to make a change that has should have been made a long time ago because all of these imageries that you see on um on products have a long history. When you go back to, let, let me see here. When you go back to uh, Cream of Wheat, since 1893, you had a black man on that box. And do you know that the black man 
that's on this box when he was working. They took a picture of him without his permission, and they've made money off of his image. His family hasn't reaped any benefits from him being on the cream of wheat box, but that's a caricature. Smile. They always used to show black people smiling with the teeth bucking out, smiling and being compliant, being a compliant individual. So these images go all the way back. When you look at uh, Uncle Ben's rice, you see that on there. Then you got Ink Jemiah on right there. And then you have the sister who played in Gone with the Wind. She won an Oscar for her role in that movie. But yet, when she won her Oscar, they would not let her accept that Oscar on front in the stage, on front of the stage in front of everybody. She had to accept her Oscar in back of the stage. Okay? And historically, they have always liked seeing black people play these, sub, these uh, subordinate images that really reinforces the racism, the 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 stereotypes, the ethnic notions, the uh, characterization, the characterization of black people in America. This has been going on for years and decades, and we still see some of it today. When you look at your Aunt Jemiah, uh pancake mix today, so what I'm going to do, along with Dr. Carr, this brother right here, I have a beautiful audio of Dr. Carr. Here he is right here. Dr. Carr, uh, this is a brother. He's a historian, a uh, deep brother. He will get into the deep history that many of us that think we know, we know that history, we may not know it. I know people have made, put videos out on YouTube so far, but I think out of all that's out there, the information that this brother put out there that will be on this video today, on this broadcast, I think is the most effective it gets right to the point, but it actually breaks down the history in more detail than you probably have ever heard. And you're going to hear it right here on the Information Man Show. He's going to talk about a book right here called The Slave in a Box, The Strange Career of Aunt Jemima, the real history behind her caricature on the box. Now, I'm about to also make some other people upset because this is an icon caricature that has been a part of American society since the very beginning. And a lot of people are very detached to this character because you go to amusement parks, your children have the uh, pajamas at home. We, some of us have worn the T-shirts. Uh, some of us have the watches. The watches were very popular back in the day. Watches, T-shirts, hats, um, and we have enjoyed going to the amusement park. And we have enjoyed the cartoons or the animated series of this particular character. But I'm sorry to say that this character that a lot of us have um, embraced in our culture, have embraced in our family, and have embraced on our children, and our children have embraced this character, this character has its roots in blackface. It has its roots in this tradition of trying to uh, marginalize black people. And this is Mickey Mouse. I'm sorry to have to say this. There are those out there that are going to probably say that I'm lying. I'm not telling the truth because you are culturally conditioned to believe and love Mickey Mouse. But here is Mickey Mouse. Mickey Mouse is nothing but an old throwback caricature. But most importantly, and Dr. Carr is going to talk about this, Mickey Mouse is another example of black face. I'm sorry to tell you that, folks, but I got to tell you the truth. Because here on the Information Man show, we tell the truth. Tell the truth. And uh, that's what it's going to have to be, whether you like it or not. Whether you like it or not, I'm going to have to tell the truth. Mickey Mouse is a blackface caricature. I'm going to prove it to you right now. Read this right here on the screen. A racist caricature called Jigaboo serves as the, as the original inspiration for Mickey Mouse caricature. Here it is right here. There you have it. There's Mickey Mouse and that is the caricature called Jigaboo. If you notice on Jigaboo's hands, 
Mickey Mouse has white gloves on. On Jigaboo's hands, when you look at it to the left side, you see white gloves. Look at Mickey Mouse's pants. Red pants with little white circles. On Jigaboo's Jigaboo's caricature, you have, once again, red pants with, in this this situation, yellow uh, circles on the pants. But what's interesting about this is that when you look at Mickey Mouse, Mickey Mouse has yellow shoes. Jigaboo had no shoes on, but still has the yellow in there. And then they always accentuated the lips of black people with the red lips. Well, look, you have uh, Mickey Mouse with that red tongue sticking out. And they always accentuated the eyes. Same thing with Mickey Mouse. You have the eyes accentuated, right? Now, on Jigaboo, you see the hair, the Piccaninny hair. These these are uh, very disturbing and very unfortunate things to have to talk about, but it's the truth, okay? Tell the truth. So you have right there the um, the picket tail sticking out. So the Mickey Mouse ears, or what we think are mouse ears, it represents that. So this is where they got the idea, the inspiration. As I said before, I'm going to put this back up because truth has to be told. A racial caricature called Jigaboo serves as the original inspiration for the Mickey Mouse character. I'm putting this back up so that you can see the comparison. I must tell the truth again. Tell the truth. You say, what does this have to do with Aunt Jemaya? It has everything to do with Aunt Jemaya because Aunt Jemaya, out of that same tradition, is a caricature. This is the original caricature right here. This is the original bag that they use for the product that we eat today, the pancakes, okay? And to make it, to bring, to drive this further home, This is the woman's original name. It was Nancy Green is the real Aunt Jemima. Let me release something off of there just real quick so we can drive this home for everyone out there listening to the program. So there you have it. That is the the original Aunt Jemima. The real Nancy Green is the original black woman that was a part of this caricature. And they made a mythology out of her uh, in a lot of ways that some of us are not as familiar with as we think we have been taught to believe. We've been culturally conditioned in America to underestimate, undervalue, and marginalize black people. We do it to ourselves as a people because we've been so culturally conditioned. But let me once again get right back to that original packaging. There she is. That's the original Aunt Jemaya, who is which has been with us for years. And it's, it's been modernized in this form where they went from her having a perm to giving, to, from no, from her having a scarf, excuse me, around her head, a handkerchief, which was reminiscent of a, a mammy character in history, the mammy look. Here, look at this right here. And this look that comes from Gone with the Wind, that look, she has a handkerchief on her head, to giving her a perm, um, changing to a perm to think that they are appealing to the sensibilities of people in society, particularly black people, when this image should have been gotten rid of. You see right there, since 1889. Let me also give you some history here. Aunt Jemaya portrays the white, romanticized notion and antebellum mammy detached from the cruelty reality of enslavement during the late 1960s, the late 19th centuries. Let me excuse my what I just said here, the 19th centuries. This is um, very important. And the family is not happy about her, um, the image of Aunt Jemaya being removed. The Quaker Oaks announced early this month that the rebranding of Aunt Aunt Jemaya pancake mix and the syrup because of its racial history. But the descendants of Lydian Richards, 
who betrayed Aunt Jemima for years, says that the company decided to rename the brand without consulting the family of the woman who brought character to li- to the character to life. Okay, so the family is not happy about it. But let me just say this: um, the inspiration for the character came from the song "Old Aunt Jemima." starting at the World's Fair in 1893. A formerly enslaved woman named Nancy Green was the first to travel around the country wearing a apron and a ban- bannet, and Aunt Jemima was born. Now, that's the history that we think, but Dr. Carr is going to let you know what the real history is because there's a lot of misinformation around Nancy Green. So I just want people uh, to realize that why I I broke some of that down in that that moment. So with that said, let me get ready to load up the audio of Brother Dr. Carr breaking it down. Once again, I want to thank everybody for listening to the uh, Information Man show. Make sure you share uh, this video in your uh, social media because this is very important. Let me put this up here because we do need this to be shared throughout the social media, share it with your friends, your loved ones. And those of you who are hearing what I'm saying and you're feeling a little uncomfortable now because I'm talking about a, a sad, a history that people don't want to deal with. And then I'm talking about your beloved Mickey Mouse. I am, I am not, I'm, I'm not sorry, really. I'm, tell the truth. I'm going to tell the truth. Mickey Mouse is nothing but a throwback character from blackface. I put up the pictures to prove it. I'm going to throw it up again. In case someone has missed that, here it is. That's the character of Jigaboo on the left side. That is Mickey Mouse, which gets its inspiration from Jigaboo. A racist character called Jigaboo served as the original inspiration for Mickey Mouse caricature. This is the truth. Tell the truth. So with that said, let me get ready to bring on Dr. Carr. He's going to speak for about 22 minutes And then after that, I'm going to end this particular show. Everybody, thank you for your support. This is the Information Man Show. reaction is information is power and like me you might see in india or other places where somebody dies you burn them you send them back to the answer you, you, you transform the elements you know black people won't put you in the ground and they will put you somewhere where they can return to you from time to time so in the South, for example, where we see cemeteries vanishing with gentrification, it's very traumatic for some people because that's what they do in homecoming, church homecoming. The, the burial ground is by the church. So you go wash the graves, for example. I've, I've helped, you know, every time we go to Alabama, you know, the, the graves of my mother's parents and grandparents, we wash those graves. Old people in the South know what that is. Young people, too, if you've done it, you go and you make sure the graves are white. Sometimes you put lime on them. You clean the grave. In other words, you're tending to your ancestors because in that mm-hmm. worldview, which is I mean, a number of different African worldviews, but the idea is you tend to your ancestors because they tend to you. So even if you don't have a body, you have a picture at your house. It's not unusual. Somebody's born in the black community. Give me a, give me that baby picture. Why? I got to put that picture in that same mirror that's got all these other pictures. <laughs> right? So why? Because these are your ancestors. So many people still alive. There you are when you were six months. In other words, you're part of a community and the dead are still part of our community. So no, burial rituals are very important for us. So yes, Nancy Green should have a headstone and it shouldn't just be a scholar. And yes, her family should feel some kind of way. But the thing about Nancy Green is Nancy Green is part of a mythology that is absolutely artificial. <laughs> Nancy Green is the first woman to play Aunt Jemima 
But Aunt Jemima is not Nancy Green. This is this is where the thing, in fact, the best book on this, as a brother who wrote a book a few years ago called Slave in a Box. Wow. Slave in a Box, Maurice Manring. If, if you get Maurice Manring's book, Slave in a Box, which uh, is, it kind of he kind of expanded. He'd been working on this for a number of times. He published some articles in scholarly journals. And there's been a lot written now on Aunt Jemima. But my thing is, for my money, start with Slave in a Box because it's the history of Aunt Jemima. And this thing is all about marketing, mass production, white women, and white men. <laughs> he ain't got nothing to do with us except the stereotype. What does it mean? Chris Rutt, Charles Underwood. Let's go back to 1888, 1889. They're in Missouri. They're in Missouri, St. Joseph, Missouri. And they got this, uh, they, they, bought, uh, they bought this milling factory. They make flour. You know, you flour for camps and people, you know, do what they do. You know, you're selling flour, you're selling flour. And then they're like, how are we going to make some money off this? So their idea is we need to create a product that we can mass market to get rid of this surplus flour because they just selling flour. So we can make pancakes. Okay, so, so they start experimenting with different recipes. They come up with a combination of wheat flour, corn flour, lime phosphate, and salt. So you gotta add milk, you got pancakes. That one worked, they tested it. Okay, so now they wanna mass produce and sell this stuff. Okay, fine. While they're doing this, they go to a minstrel show. This true story. Guy gets slave in a box. He walks through all this, right? They had the minstrel show, because you know, this is 1889. People love the minstrel show. What is the minstrel show? Read Eric Lott's book, Love and Theft. Read any of the work of William Lehman, his book, Jump Jim Crow, uh, Blacking Up from a Generation Ago. There's a lot of stuff been written about this by recent scholars, or go back to the time itself and go read the black newspapers. Because see, the thing about scholars is, when they say, well, this is an undiscovered part, no, just go, you know how you discovered it? You went back and read <laughs> the black people who were talking about it when it was going on. So, <laughs> no, I, I get you. I, I, you know, I'm going to buy the book. I'm going to read the book. But don't act like we weren't confronting this at the time. But the one thing I will say, though, in, in respect of all these scholars who write about these subjects now is that by writing about it now, you're doing what Vincent Harding said we need to do. You got to make it contemporary. So respect on that. That's why Slave in a Box is so good. So he, so he, he said, these guys go to the minstrel show. They love the minstrel show. What is the minstrel show? It's mostly working class or working poor whites putting on black makeup, pretending to be black. And in Eric Lott's book, Love and Theft, he talks about this blackface minstrelsy and the American working class. He's saying these white people feel better about themselves because they clown at black people, which reminds them they're not black people. That's really what these stereotypes are. Jim Crow, uh, Zip Coon, his cousin, who's like the city version of Jim Crow. And all we got to do, whether it be uh, the, the film Ethnic Notions or all the films we've seen discuss, if we want to think about them in today's terms, go to any black movie. The loud eye roll, the, the neck buck, you know, this kind of thing. All this thing, it make people feel better because I'm, you know, I'm not you. And, and like Dave Chappelle said, when I figured out they was laughing at me and not with me, I'll see y'all later. <laughs> In other words, yeah, because I mean, they like they like when you play the crack at it. Why? Because it's like, they ain't laughing with you. They laughing at you. So the whole point is that they go to the Minstrel Show in 1889 and they see a performer. Baker and Farrell had a routine. Baker and Farrell, two minstrels at this show. They doing a the cakewalk and they call the tune they're walking to, the dance, the old Aunt Jemima. They was like, yo, <laughs> There's our market. Look, there it is. Why? Because the pancakes work. We can make them fast. We selling some. But you know how we gonna really sell them? Y'all know that white people everywhere, they gonna eat some uh, black lady cook. There it is right there. <laughs> if it's a black cook, if it's a black cook on the joint, we good. <laughs> so what happens is <laughs> they the first Aunt Jemima on the box is the minstrel picture, the straight stereotype. Just like the first uh, cream of wheat on the box was Uncle Rastus. Rastus was another one of these coon figures, one of these minstrel figures, not looking like a human being, the blackface figure. 
In fact, we would have to talk about this another day because ultimately Disney puts a living Aunt Jemima in one of their exhibits uh, at, the, at the recreation park. And of course, we know Disney started a lot of that minstrelsy because Mickey Mouse is a black-faced minstrel. There's a whole line of scholarship on it. Oh Look at God. it. Black with the white in the nose. Oh no, it's a whole, it's back. It's, I had a book over here now. Anyway, we had to talk about that another day. Those early Disney cartoons, please. Yeah, I'm glad they're going to the Princess and the Frog and getting rid of my man. Where my man at? I had him over uh, here a minute ago. Mr. Zippity Doodah. Yeah, Uncle Remus. There's Uncle Remus. Joe Chandler Harris, Song of the South. Yeah, Disney getting rid of it. But you had Aunt Jemima flipping pancakes in one of your exhibits with the fake story that Aunt Jemima was a slave out of Louisiana who was cooking for an old colonel who was down there. And then after the war, she moved north and with her husband. They gave Aunt Jemima a husband, Uncle Mose. And Uncle Mose would get everybody's stuff off the, off the stagecoach, come in, Aunt Jemima had the pancakes, and they had an exhibit at Disney on this. I mean, so you could come in there and see her flipping pancakes. So yeah, yeah, all y'all wasting y'all money at Walt Disney. Stone Cold racist. Mickey Mouse was a black-faced minstrel. But we talk about that another day. So Aunt Jemima, they put the first one on was the minstrel picture. And then they, they went out of business. Ruit and Underwood went out of business. They sold the business. R.T. Davis was a marketer who bought it. Purred Wright, he hires Purred Wright. Purred Wright is a writer. So they come together and they say, you know what? We're going to get this better. They find, they said, we're going to put out a campaign and we're going to find us a living age of mind because they trademarked the name. See, trademark copyright, you know this better than I do. They're yeah. two different things. Working on Trademarks it. can go forever. Copyrights, you got to renew. If you can trademark that name, that's your name. I got the trademark. So they trademark Aunt Jemima. They change the formula a little bit. They add powdered milk. What does that mean? Now you need is water. We got it. We good. We good. We good. We good. We good. <laughs> we need... Now we need a living Aunt Jemima because we're gonna we're gonna make up a backstory and she's gonna have her flipping pancakes. So what do they do? They put out a campaign and they identify a woman who was born in Montgomery County, Kentucky during enslavement, 59 years old, Chicago. Her name is Nancy Green. They say, Miss Green, yes, we'd like you to become Aunt Jemima. Fast forward to 2020. This ain't no different than any Madison Avenue pitch. They looking for the human being, fast forward to 2020, on a commercial. Y'all gonna see that lady selling Popeye's chicken in a minute. Hey, that chicken for Popeye. In other words, oh, look, we need a person. <laughs> the box, it's that we we'll get, get rid of that coon image. This is the modern, we're going into the 20th century. We need a, and where did they debut her? In 1893, Chicago hosts the Columbian World Exposition because they're celebrating in, 18, in 1892, the anniversary, well, I guess it'd be 1492 to 1892, the 400th year anniversary of Columbus getting lost. So now, but the World's Fair is the Columbian Exposition, the 400 year thing in the United States gonna be in Chicago. And in Chicago, they set up Nancy Green flipping pancakes at the World's Fair with this big stage, and she is a smash at the World's Fair of 1893. Oh, I'm sorry. And they add her picture to the box, and they give her a quote. Eyes in town, honey. That's the quote. <laughs> Eyes in town, honey. Aunt Jemima is in town. I'm flipping them cakes. Now, here's the thing that make you, that'll really make you, man. Oh, I'm sorry, Purred Wright. Oh, I'm sorry, Purred Wright. He's the writer they hired, right? Purred Wright's like, yeah, the image is good. The box is good. She was a hit at this World's Fair. Let's put her on the road, and I'm going to give her a backstory. He publishes a pamphlet. The name of the pamphlet, The Life of Aunt Jemima, the most famous colored woman in the world. He makes up a whole backstory. We found her in Louisiana where she was still making pancakes long after the Civil War in a little red cap. Her husband, Uncle Mose. All this, he makes this whole story up. Now, here's the thing that really makes you mad. Well, a number of things make us mad, right? Because we ain't even got into the point <laughs> century yet. <laughs> here's the thing that's really crazy. 
1893, the Columbian World Exposition, and Jemima in there flipping pancakes. I'm sorry, Nancy Green in there flipping pancakes under the name Aunt Jemima. They done wrote her a backstory and everything. Who else is there? And not because they invited them. Fred Douglas, I. Garland Penn, a writer, journalist, and the great Ida Bell Wells. Ida Wells, Fred Douglas, and, 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 and I. Garland Penn write a pamphlet because Black people wanted this the 400th anniversary, right? Yeah, well, you know, F. Columbus, but uh, we Black, we here, we want a display on what Black people have done in world history and in the United States. World's Fair is like, shit, hell no. We <laughs> know, y'all know. <laughs> so what, is, what does Ida Wells do? Because, you know, Douglas get, lends his name to it. And some, but you know, Fred Douglas is going to be dead in two years. The Lion of Anacostia is about at, out at the exit. But he's, he's like, I'm feeling you, Ida, on this. I'm feeling you, I Garland Penn. You young bucks, go ahead and do this. They write a pamphlet called Why the American, why the, why the Colored American is not at the Columbian World Expo. They write a whole critique of the whole thing. They come with the pamphlet to the World's Fair. World's Fair people are like, shit, you ain't got no pavilion, so you can't sell this here. Now, all these people, I respect people saying, we Americans. But you know, we be like, okay, all right, I ain't gonna argue with y'all. But I'm gonna tell you how they got that pamphlet out. The Haitians had a pavilion. The Haitians was like, yeah, what did they say? They said, we couldn't sell. Come on, cuz. The Haitians... Gave out of Wells and them space in the Haitian pavilion to sell the pamphlet. Why the colored American is not in the Atlanta? Because they said we are fam. Come on now, we related. Yeah, I'm from Haiti. Yeah, you from the United States. But look, we're family. Come in this pavilion and you put that out. Now picture that. In one part of World's Fair, out of Wells is in like this is some bullshit. In another part of World's <laughs> Fair, Miss Green flipping pancakes and your mama eyes here, honey. <laughs> so, th- I mean, wow. this is the bizarre nature of white nationalism. They have figured out how to extract value from black stereotype at the same time living black people are like, nah. And who's caught in the middle? Miss Green. Who, by the way, makes it up into 1923 as, um, as Aunt Jemima. I read a couple of articles that speculate because they put her on a tour, national tour a little bit. She might have been in Atlanta in 1895 at the International Cotton Exposition. And if she was there, that means she was flipping pancakes in Atlanta the same time Booker T. Washington was giving that famous speech in Atlanta, we can cast down your bucket where you are because that's where he gave the speech. So anyway, so you got Miss Green operating at the same time and they making money. So what happens? She gets hit by a car in Chicago and dies. She dies then. Aunt Jemima, oh, I'm sorry. Let's go back 20 years before she passes. In 1903, they changed the name of the company to Aunt Jemima Mills. Because this woman, like Bessie Smith made Columbia Records, like, you know, Capitol Records, Nat Cole, Capitol Records, like when Ray Charles flipped the script and when he left uh, when he left uh, uh, Atlantic and went to ABC, so I want my masters, like Sam Cooke was like, I want my masters, like Barry Gordy started Motown. They understood the lessons who had been learned by, like Jay-Z said, you're going to pay me for what you owe the Cold Crush Brothers. In other words, now we understand the power of our brand. But back then, they would take that brand and make whole companies. They changed the name of the company to Aunt Jemima Mills. Quaker buys it. Oh, I'm sorry. Let's go forward three years to 1906. They lynch your black people. 1906 is when, of course, they had the, uh, uh, what happened in 1906? The Atlanta riot, the Du Bois rights about. Oh, it was 1904. But anyway, 1906, they start a promotion. They say, we're we're going to give y'all for for three, what is it, for three cents, no, for six cents, we're going to give you six pennies. We're going to give you coupons. Or you could give us three zero, 30 cents, and we send you an Aunt Jemima doll. They gave them both offers. More people picked the Aunt Jemima doll. We want the doll to sit up in our house while we're making these pancakes. So guess wow. what? You know what I'm saying? So that was the doll campaign was 23. That's the same year Miss Green passed away with the art with the uh, car accident. Two years later, Quaker Oats buys Aunt Jemima and they engage in another search from 1933 to 1951. Anna Robinson is the living Aunt Jemima. From 19, then she's followed by 
uh, a sister named Wilson, Edith Wilson. Edith Wilson is Aunt Jemima. In other words, the reason Aunt Jemima was so powerful was because there was a living person on radio, living person in ads, living person. That they, had, they had articles in Ladies Home Journal. They placed the article in Ladies Home Journal in 1917 to say, here's the backstory of Aunt Jemima. That's where they have Uncle Moe's and all that. And that's where the story gets blended in because they say she was a living person who made these pancakes. We finally convinced her to sell the recipe and that's what you eating. That's a lie. The white boys made that recipe up in 1889. They brought the sister in a few years later to personalize it and how the white women playing this because the way they marketed it was you white women in y'all kitchens and we know it wasn't white women in the kitchens it was black women in the kitchens we're gonna make your life easier all you gotta do is add some water and you got pancakes and it was a black woman just like in them old days don't you wish you was one of them plantation mistresses and then well we got a slave in a box for your ass i mean this, this, they marketing it to white women you know what i'm saying and of course we're now in the moment where they begin to see household appliances and begin to see you know ease and comfort so they've got this collision of plantation stereotypes ease and comfort white women being able to see themselves as domestic goddesses Oh, yes, I'm in my kitchen with my automatic this and my automatic and my Aunt Jemima. And I'm listening to the soap opera, meaning what? The working class opera, because I am. A, and I have, and you ain't doing any of that. I, you got people in your family, I'm sure you do, like I do. My mother, I've been in some of them houses. You know, my father working all the time. My mother takes out side work and she in the house polishing stuff, cooking. They call her by her first name. I'm a little boy, like I'll punch this white boy in his face. But because you're the same age I am, I would never call my mother by her first name. But this is the stereotype that they're pushing these pancakes with. But you know, black people, black power movement comes, these Negroes ain't having it. You know what, you gotta do something about Angie Mama. 1968, they switch out her Take bandana. Her or yeah. handkerchief. Yeah, that's right. That's right. They're all shit. We got it. And of course, if, if, the sister who's still alive. I, I said that last time I saw her exhibit on Aunt Jemima was at the New York um, Historical Society a couple of years ago. Oh, you, Sar, Betty Sar, the great black woman uh, artist, still alive. She's done this whole series of uh, art pieces on Aunt Jemima, kind of free that stereotype. And she's not alone. There have been another people who have done it. Uh, but this idea, in fact, uh, my man uh, who wrote Slave in a Box, he had a uh, he had a phrase for it. Oh, I can't think of the name of it, but it'll, it'll come to me in a minute. Hold on, give me about five seconds if I just be quiet for a second. I can't think of it. Anyways, it's got mammy in it. It's like mammy marketing or mammy marketing. Well, are you going to market the mammy? And we still see that archetype. So let's bring it to a close. We know in 1989, like you said, they give her some earrings, they give her a perm. But like Chuck D and Big Daddy Kane them said in Burn, Hollywood Burn, we like, she still ain't your mama, even if she got a perm. But the whole complicated idea comes in with the idea, what do you do with that image? Because cream of wheat um, and what's the other one? Uncle Ben's right, Uncle ben. right? They too try to put a human being on it. And then they try to do a little backstory. All these guys were chefs in Chicago. And then, you know, yeah, nah, you want, you want that beloved Negro that you trust feeding you, even as we read the history of enslavement and realize that that's the way we was able to poison a lot of these people was to feed them glass and all kind of other stuff. And, and, and James Madison's grandfather was probably killed by the evil women at Montpierre. There's a great book by Doug Chambers called Murder at Montpierre. Yeah, they cooked him many a good meal and he died. But, <laughs> but, but I mean, but, and, but the idea that you can trust black people to cook for you, Aunt Jemima's at the center of that. And, and I'll close with this. Because Quaker Oats had a symbol too, that Quaker dude. The difference between all of those and Aunt Jemima was the Aunt Jemima had the best developed backstory. They made her into a human being. And so it really turned into a thing where people felt a deep connection with first Nancy Green and then them other sisters. Because they, regardless, we, we don't care about your name. All we know is we need somebody to play you. And we will reward you by making you a beloved figure. Hell, we might even mess around and take that archetype and give it Academy Awards. I don't know, I still haven't seen Precious. Uh, you, you, we still yeah. might, I mean, in other words, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I, I mean, and that's no shade to the sister who, you know, played the lead role or to our sister who has pushed back against Oprah and all of them and say, you know, if they don't, you don't do what they like because it ain't got nothing to do with you as a human being. It's got something to do with satisfying the white imagination and the white stereotype of what black people are. And in this case, what black women are. And so, yeah, they gave up the picture they will probably, I can't imagine they won't keep the name. 
And there's a whole body of scholarship too, which I kind of am really fascinated by, which tries to determine where did the name Jemima come from? I've seen some scholarship and, I, and even if this isn't true, I just like it. The idea that Jemima might be an Anglicization of Yimiya, because we know Yimiya is one of the Yoruba Orishas who along with Oshun is like the mother, like they control the water, either the river or the ocean. So Yemiah, is that where Jemima came from? They couldn't say Jemima said, well, if it is, it's an Africanism, which means the original Aunt Jemima is on the other side of the water. And if y'all mess with her, she will drown all of y'all. So I mean, <laughs> and, and there's some art that kind of gestures toward that during the Black Arts Movement. When you look at the Black, they got pictures like Aunt Jemima as a Yoruba goddess, and she putting the water on them. It's like, okay, I see you. But we're not, we're not out of the woods because they took a picture of Information is power. Tell, Tell the, the truth. truth. Information is power. You are listening to Information Man. Please make sure to subscribe to his channel. Information is power. The reaction is coming in. Tell the truth. Okay, everybody, thank you for tuning in to the Information Man show. I hope um, that helped to put a little bit of light into this whole issue around the HMAMA, ancient mama uh, mythology, the history. I think Dr. Carr, this brother here, uh, he did a good job of really breaking down the history. Uh, I think the best I've heard, and maybe the best information on YouTube uh, that money can buy. I mean, um, he, he gave a breakdown. There is some mythology behind the story that was not true. And, um, and he's right. Even though they took the face and image off the box, they're probably going to hold on to the name because the name is that's a brand and that's marketing. And most people are culturally conditioned that when they hear that name, they know exactly what you're talking about. So they're probably going to hold on to the name, but change to take the image off in a way to say, mm, we're not uh, being um, racial towards black people. So that's why, even though they're taking the image off, don't get up and get all in your hoopla and think, oh, it's a new day in America. No, they're going to probably hold on to that name, possibly. I said possibly for marketing purposes. And really, if you take images off of mark off of boxes, whatever, um, yeah, it, it's all great. It's symbolism that you're getting rid of, but you gotta have equality and justice. You gotta replace it with justice and equality for those that you've been uh, that you've been uh pushing racial stereotypes towards. I wonder uh for Quaker Oaks, General Mitt, whatever you want to call it. Uh, how many of them have executives or have people in positions such as black people to be able to say, hey, that's the wrong thing to be marketing. That that's a that's a a, a disrespect to uh, black people. That's a disrespect to these to many people. Um because one of the things there's there's when you degrade a people's history and the people's humanity, uh that is completely racial. It is a complete disrespect. And I think people who went out and brought pancakes and brought that, I don't know if you thought about it that way or you just or you, you just enjoyed the pancakes themselves or did you enjoy the whole experience of eating the pancakes along with this image of a black person? Because like the brother, like Dr. Carr said, it was sort of like having a slave on the box, bringing you back to all the good old day, the good old days of the South. 
that white people saw that it was the good old days. I'm not black people. Other groups of people saw it as the good old days when you had black people in certitude in slavery. And then when you bring it up to the 50s and 60s, 70s and on up today, the idea of having this subordinate black person on the box as you eat this food gives you this lethalgia feeling psychologically on a little subconscious level. It's almost like you like to bring it on back to the plantation days. So peace to you all out there. Uh, don't sleep on the stuff that I talked about, about Mickey Mouse. Let me put this back on the screen again because you just can't sleep on that history. This is true history about the Mickey Mouse comparison. I know that some of you out there are very upset right now because you buy things for your kids like the Mickey Mouse watches, Mickey, you know, Mickey Mouse uh, lunch boxes, Mickey Mouse pajamas, Mickey Mouse toothbrushes, Mickey Mouse every goddamn thing. Well, guess what? Especially to my people out there, that is nothing but a throwback to the Jigaboo character. So you might want to rethink whether you want to have Mickey Mouse in your life. I certainly don't want it anywhere in my life knowing the history. This is Information Man Show. Information is power. With that said, I'll be back with more broadcast. You take care. You share this video in your social media. Tell people about it. Share it with your friends, family, and loved ones. And Information Man will be back. And don't forget to support the Information Man Speaks podcast. You got to check this out. I got some great things going on over there. The Information Man Speaks podcast. Uh, we're doing big things over there on the second channel. Make sure you subscribe to the second channel. You can find the second channel on this channel right now. My first channel, The Information Man Show. And when you scroll down at the bottom, you will see and you can click the subscriber link and make sure you hit the bell of notification. With that said, take care, everybody. This is The Information Man. Peace. Information is power. Information Man, please make sure to subscribe to his channel. Tell the information Tell the truth. is power. Information is power. You are listening to Information Man. Tell the truth. Please make sure to subscribe to his channel. Information is power. Tell the truth. Information is Tell power. Tell the truth. You are listening is to the information power. man. Please make sure to subscribe to his channel.